The other day I was scrolling on TikTok and I came across this guy who looks at globes, like world map globes. From the way that the globe looks, he is able to date when it was made by seeing which countries exist and what they're called. This is a great example of how much we can learn from looking at a map. And we can learn even more from a map if it displays data, which is the case of the maps we'll be taking a look at in this video. 12 maps about the United States of America, which provide us with information about each of the states or counties teaching us interesting information about them and also allowing us to compare them with each other. For each of the maps I show, I'm going to try and draw a conclusion, reasoning, or a characteristic we can attribute to the state because of it. Starting with the ones on the thumbnail, first, average life expectancy. If we round it up or down, the life expectancy age in the United States ranges between 74 to 81 years. That is a pretty big gap. This means that if you live in California, you are on average likely to live seven more years than someone who lives in Mississippi. In this map, we can see it all. The darker the green, the higher the life expectancy, and the darker the yellow, orange, or red, the lower. Most states have a reasonably high life expectancy, although only 10 are above 80 years old, with Hawaii being the highest and the only one that's above 81 years. The lowest seems to be Mississippi at 74.91. Nine states are below the 77 years mark in orange or or red and five others below the 78 mark in yellow. This means that a state like California or Hawaii has an equivalent life expectancy to the countries of Portugal or the United Kingdom, while Alabama or Louisiana the same life expectancy as El Salvador or Libya. There aren't many regional trends when it comes to the highest, although the lowest states are all concentrated in the east or southeast region. So why do some states have a higher life expectancy than others, which are the factors that cause the average age to go up or down. I tried looking this up and the answer is pretty much everything. Almost every single factor you can think of will in some way influence a state's life expectancy. Obviously there are some main influences like socioeconomic status. If you have more money you perhaps don't deal with as many issues and you're able to afford healthier living conditions. The availability of healthcare in the US also related in part to economic status but also other things like education or just a lifestyle that people happen to follow there. Who knows maybe Hawaiians live longer because they get to enjoy more sun and more beach time. And next, the largest minority by state. And you know what, to be precise, let's do it by county. Caucasians are the largest ethnic group in every single US state. And in only 17 states do they not represent over 50% of the population. However, in some very few counties, non-Hispanic whites are technically considered a minority simply because they do not represent over 50% of the population. It might still be 49. For you to get an idea, according to the latest census, the US population countrywide is 60% Caucasian, 18.5% Hispanic, 12% African American, 5% Asian, and less than 1% Native American. You could also divide the Caucasians into different origins, Germans, Irish, English, Italian, etc. But the ones which represent the biggest minorities are African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans. In this map, we can get some pretty interesting pieces of information. First, Asian Americans are the largest minority in very few places, some that stand out are Seattle, San Jose, Boston, and Honolulu. African Americans are the largest minority in most of the South and East Coast. Despite being very few and only a large group in low population counties, Native Americans are able to be the biggest minority in almost all of Oklahoma, as well as some counties in the very north. This next map is about US state mottos. It's categorized in the language that the motto is in, although here they're all translated to English so we can understand them. California is the only one with a Greek motto, although it's somewhat of an adopted word into every language. Most states' mottos are in English, and the second largest group is Latin. Washington state is the only one in the native Chinook Yagon language, Hawaii's is in Hawaiian, and only three states use three different languages, French in Minnesota, Italian in Maryland, and Spanish in Montana. When it comes to the models themselves, some are interesting, some are more simple and kind of boring. Utah's model being just industry is kind of weird. Minnesota's Star of the North is pretty cool, Alaska's North to the Future as well, and despite being very long, Hawaii also has a great one. Tennessee's motto is Agriculture and Commerce, and while this this is an agriculture, one of the biggest rural commercial activities in the US is the creation of cattle. The next map shows us the amount of cattle per 1,000 people in each county. The legend is above, and what instantly calls our attention is the fact that in the counties displayed in red, there are more cows 
than people. Now, many of these are counties with low population, so we don't need many cows to overcome them, but still, many highly populated counties are also able to have more cattle than people. Countrywide, there are 94 million heads of cattle versus 323 million people, so each cow would still have to take down three and a half humans in order for them to take power. Cattle farming is an industry that consumes a ridiculous amount of water. The world spends over 12,000 liters of water per kilogram of beef produced. That is a lot. We're always told to save water and we should, but remember that the biggest spenders are these big industrial companies and not the common people. Although we consume the products that they produce, so it's all connected, but this next map shows us precisely the estimated domestic water usage. Essentially how many gallons of water each person uses per day on average. This includes watering lawns, etc. The darker the color, the biggest water usage, but remember this is per capita. The Northeast clearly uses less water, perhaps due to a less hot climate that doesn't demand it as much, but again, the highest value here is 225 gallons per day. Most of these maps need to take into account each state or each county's population because some have significantly more people than others, and that should impact the way we analyze the information displayed. The next map is about population itself and presents us with a percentage change in population per county. So from 2010 to 2020, how much population did each county gain? The counties in brown are the ones which lost population, although this map doesn't specify how much. In yellow or blank are counties that grew up to 5% in the past 10 years, and then the darker the green or blue, the biggest the population growth, up to 20% or more for the darkest shade. We need to remember though that if a county has 100 people and it grows to 130, then it grew 30% just by gaining 30 people, while if a county county has 100,000 people and grows to 120, it just grew 20%. The percentage might be smaller, but the value itself is higher. So these maps are a little misleading, and this perhaps justifies the fact that we don't see that high of a percentage growth on the coasts, the highest populated areas in the country, while we see 20% and over increases in many of the Midwest and Northern counties. However, there are some exceptions in Texas and the East Coast, especially Florida, where high population areas also show high percentage increases. So far, we've been looking at a US map divided between states or counties, but what if the country was divided in another way? Many of the lines dividing these regions are artificial. They resulted of some treaty or agreement, but mostly decided by a group of men with a map, a ruler, and a pen. What if this hadn't been the case, and the internal borders of the US were based not on these fictional lines, but on the natural barriers of the land? These would include mostly, if not exclusively, rivers, lakes, and mountains and valleys. In this hypothetical map made by the Atlas Pro, the continental US would be divided not into 50, but into 28 separate states. And honestly, they look pretty good. That forsaken part of Michigan that is in the Wisconsin Peninsula is gone for that reason alone. I think this is a valid hypothesis. When we overlap this division map with a map that contains the rivers of the US or one that contains the mountainous regions, we can understand why these divisions are where they are. And while this will obviously never happen, it does sound like more of a logical division. Does anyone know why state borders are the way they are? If you don't, I can make a video about it because I honestly don't know either. The next map is about mega regions, but what is a mega region? In the US, mega regions are clustered networks of cities, similarly to what happens in Japan with their megalopolis or the Taiyeyo Belt, which connects various cities. It's literally that, urban centers that are so big that they end up connecting with each other. In the US, there are 11, according to this map, and they are estimated to contain a total population of over 237 million people. About two thirds of the entire country lives in these 11 areas. In fact, some of the mega regions are so large that they're beginning to connect with each other, like North and South California, Piedmont Atlantic, the Northeast and the Great Lakes, and the Texas Triangle and the Gulf Coast already have. This is mostly due to population concentration in cities rather than the countryside. And who lives in cities? People. What do people sometimes follow? Religions? Was this a forced transition? Yes. The next map shows us the percentage of people following the Jewish faith by each US state. And I was surprised by how low it is. The highest value is just over 7% and that's only found in the state of New York. The cluster of states around it on the East Coast have percentages between 3 and 7. Florida and California range between 3 and 5. And then only a handful of other states have between 2 to 3% of their population being Jewish, with the vast majority being 0 or at most 1. And in contrast, we can look at Christianity, this time by county. This map doesn't present us with the 
values or percentage of people that are Christian. Instead, it presents us with a division between Protestantism, Catholicism, and Mormonism, and allows us to see which areas of the US have a prevalence of one of these three types of Christianity. Only Utah and part of Idaho are Mormon. The vast, vast majority is mostly Protestant. And then we have some areas that are more Catholic, mostly on the Upper East Coast, California, and Southern Louisiana, as well as Southern Texas. Nevada and Arizona seem to be the states where the three types of Christianity mix the most. You know who's a Catholic country as well? Portugal. And in this other map, we can see the percentage of Portuguese Americans by state. This might actually be why the Upper East Coast has a high level of Catholics. Rhode Island has the largest percentage, with 9% of the population being Portuguese. Massachusetts is next, with around 5%, and then these states around it as well. On the West Coast, California, Nevada, and Oregon each have up to 1% of the population, and Hawaii surprised me, having at least 3% of its residents being of Portuguese origin. And finally, a cool map that shows us the oldest building in each state, establishing a key difference between two categories, those who were built by natives and those who were built by colonizers. Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico have the oldest remaining buildings, dating back to around the year 750, built by the ancestral native Pueblo people. The only other two states that have pre-colonial buildings as their oldest are Georgia, the Okmulgee Earth Lodge from 1015, and Hawaii, the Malayo Eyao from 1200. And what's also interesting is how this map allows us to see which areas were colonized first and last. The East Coast was the earliest, dating back to the 17th century. Only Puerto Rico and Kansas have 16th century buildings as remnants of the Spanish colonial empire. Then comes the West Coast and the area further west of the East Coast, along with Texas, colonized next with buildings from the 18th century. And finally, the middle area of the US and Alaska, which were colonized later with the oldest buildings being from the 19th century. So, those were some interesting maps about the US that teach us important information about the country and each of its states or counties. And like I said at the beginning, allowing us to compare them with each other on a few of the subjects. What did you think of the video and this data? Let me know in the comments. Leave your opinions, thoughts, additional information you might have, and even corrections if you found anything wrong. Thanks so much for watching, subscribe if you want, and I will see you next time for more general knowledge.